So why? So why is your brain so important? Why is it so important that we pay attention to now and look after it? Secondly, we're going to go just uh, you know what does your brain require? There's some very specific things that you need, uh, and we'll go over some of those. And then in the last little section of the presentation, we're just going to go over some very very practical steps of how it is that we can protect and optimize our brain. So. Um, you know, this time of COVID has, has been an interesting time because it's, it's created a lot of uncertainty, it's created a lot of unpredictability. Uh, our brains kind of tend to crave uh, predictability, they tend to crave, crave pattern. Um, and, and in this time, you know, you've heard people saying, well, things will never be the same again, uh, the world will certainly change, and, and, and I agree with that. Um, but because of the unpredictability, um, we, we've all got our stories to share. Uh, we've all got our experiences, and, and I'd like to just share something that happened to me just uh, four or five days ago. So, uh, no, none of you really know me that well, but one of my highest values is exercise, and, and, and one of the things I love, 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 love to do is to climb on a mountain. So, as I'm standing here, the mountain for me is in that direction. Um, and, and very often I go around in the mountain, I go around on my own, but sometimes with my wife, and, and I land with a particular running buddy called Willem. And Willem and I were chatting just recently, and we were talking about geez, like, well, I remember, you know, how we'd wake up early in the morning, it's dark, and we put our cow packs on and snacks and our head torches on, and we head off path of car for us, and we head up, and then sort of halfway up the climb, we would see that the, 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 the so 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 the mountain is here, and the, and the, and the sun comes from from this side, so we're climbing up the mountain, and the sun comes from the side, and so we halfway up the mountain. And the face of the mountain is kind of illuminated and we see the city waking up and it's, it's an unbelievable scene. And, 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 and then we get to the top and we, and we without fail, say, geez, like, well, uh, how grateful and how special and how privileged we are to be at the top of the mountain. And that got me thinking when I was talking to him is that in, my, in the clinic, in the outpatient clinic that I was in, in the States when I was still in my chiropractic undergrad, is that in the, in the waiting room there was the sign that said, you know, we, we, we take things for granted until they get taken away. Take things for granted until they're taken away. And that's none more true than our health, but also our brains. You know, when our brains get taken away from us, then, then there's not much recovery from that. But the good news is that we can protect our brains and prevent it from happening. So at the time of cognitive design, design, keep saying design, decline, um, things like Alzheimer's or dementia, it, there's not a lot of treatment that we can do around that, and not a lot of the, the, the medical profession can do it. But without question, you can delay it or you can prevent it. So to get into the, to the why, it, it, it is I wanted to make this fairly exponential. I don't want to give you a neuroanatomy letter, a, a lesson on you know, how much the brain weighs and the, the different regions of the brain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's make it exponential. So what I want you to do is that as you're sitting, at your desk there in front of your computers as you're watching this, I just want you to just gently put your chin to your chest. And from there, just look up at the ceiling and just feel that movement come back to the front, turn your head to the left side, and then turn your head to the right side. And then just reach up as though you're having a nice deep big stretch. Don't you can just do it with one arm because you've got to loop in your arms. And then just stretch out to the side. And then as you lie there, sit, sitting there, just perhaps to your side, and just go into rotation on it. Make sure I don't knock that board over, and then to the other side. And just feel that movement. Feel the movement in your body. Now, I want you to just go back a step, and, and I want you to just look around you. Look around your desk if you're at your desk, and if your vision board's in front of you, look at your vision board. And if you had a window, just look outside. Look at the leaves, look at the sun, is the sun shining, is the clouds in the sky, is the wind blowing, is it sunny, is it, look around you, what's on your desk, where's your vision board. And then quietly just shift your focus to what it is that you're hearing. You know, are you hearing the hum of the traffic outside? Are you hearing the birds? Are you hearing the dishes clinking as someone in the kitchen? And then just shift your focus a little bit to what's surrounding you, and just touch and feel the things. Touch the keyboard, pick up the pen, 
What's the texture of the pen like? What does the keyboard feel like? What is the chair that you're sitting on? What does it feel like? Just get, in, get into touch with your touch. And if you've got a cup of coffee in front of you or a cup of tea, just pick it up, taste that. Sweet, bitter, hot, cold. You've got a snack, eat it. What does it taste like? Sweet, sour. And then shift your focus just a little bit to your smell. What do you smell? Do you smell the dinner cooking? Do you smell your perfume? Do you smell the breeze from outside? Do you smell the farm animals if you're on a farm? <laughs> Particularly on Hannah, when I say that. Just get in touch with those five senses. And now as you say that, as you close your eyes, and as you close your eyes, just connect with your wick. Connect with your wildly impossible goal. And connect specifically to those core desired feelings that God has asked us to write down. And I want you to really feel them. Feel them in your soul, in your heart. Just feel them in there. And imagine your goals coming true. And then just check in with what that means for you. Check into that meaning. And then I want you to shift your focus a little bit once you've done that. Is I want you to see on the left hand side of your desk, I want you to see this juicy, red, large apple. And on the right side of your desk, I want you to see this creamy ring donut. And I want you to decide which one you think that you will eat, but make that decision. And then the last one I want you to do is I want you to just connect with someone who you deeply feel connected to. Someone you love, your spouse, your partner, significant other, your mother, your father, grandfathers, your kids, but just deeply connect with them. So you can open your eyes again and just come back into the room with me. Uh, and, and so what I've done there, that experiential uh, exercise is that we've engaged a couple of different things. We've engaged movement, you've engaged all five of your senses. I've asked you just to engage with your imagination, your feelings, the meanings, how you decide, and the connection. And every single one of those things that you've just done involves your brain. Every single thing that we do in our lives involves our brain, without exception, without exception. So there's two points that I want to make here. One is that, firstly, it's your, your brain is deeply and intimately connected to everything that you do, absolutely everything. The second point is that the better that your brain works, the better that you work. So the better that your brain works, the better that you work. And so, that to, so in order for us to have a deep experience and to uh, create meaning in our lives, it's important that our brain works well. So, um, it turns out then that in order for our brains to work properly, there are specific ingredients. So, so my family know that when it's my birthday, I, 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 I don't, I mean, they can give me presents, but it's not like a, it's not like I have to have presents. But what I absolutely have to have on my birthday is I have to have a carrot cake. And I like to have a cup of coffee with it. But when my wife Lynn makes that carrot cake, there are very specific things that she needs to put into it in order for that cake to come out as the cake that we all love, juicy and fluffy and like we want. So if she leaves anything else, it's going to come out of flop. Or if she puts too much of something in, it's also going to come out of flop. Too little of something, it's also going to come out of flop. So in order for our brains to work, we need all of these ingredients. It turns out that there are seven ingredients. And I'm going to go through them very, very briefly. Um, so, the so the seven things that we bring in our brains, we absolutely need movement. We absolutely need connection. We absolutely need calmness in our lives. And these three things over here, I'm going to go through in a little bit more detail uh, in the next uh, couple of minutes. And I'm going to just very briefly mention the next four. We absolutely need to sleep. We need to sleep properly when we sleep. Uh, there's a specific uh, a, a drainage system in, in, in the brain that we call the lymphatic system, which drains our brain of toxins. Uh, one of the, the theories behind uh, Alzheimer's and, and neurocognitive design, uh, decline rather, is that there's this buildup of, of, of gunk 
in, in the brain, which, which prevents the, the brain from functioning properly, and sleep helps to drain the brain. We absolutely need challenge. The body and, and the brain needs new things. It needs to model things. It needs to learn, and, and those need to be maybe challenged in those. It can't be something that we've done, and it's an easy thing to do. We need challenge. We need to, to believe, so, so connecting to our purpose, uh, also connecting to some kind of faith, if we have, have that faith. And then thirdly, uh, or rather seventhly over here, we need to have the proper nutrition. So for example, if we eat too much sugar, too much sugar uh, is likely to increase the, the likelihood of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's now referred to as type 3 diabetes, and that really comes around having too much, um, too much sugar in our, in our diet. Very basic and very simplistic, very simplistic way to go like that. So let's connect a little bit with these two things over here. And the first thing we're going to go on with, to connect with is connection. So the brain craves connection, and there are a couple of different things and a different, uh, uh, um, couple of different things that we can consider here. We, we can consider the brain and the gut connection. So what's happening in the brain is deeply connected to what's happening in the gut. So intuition. Intuition sort of comes from our gut, and we feel that intuition from the gut, we feel it in the brain. The brain and the heart, so where we feel connected and loved, uh, the brain heart connection. Uh, we can talk about the values purpose connection. Uh, so, if, if for example, I have a my particular value is freedom, uh, but I find myself in, in an office all day, and, and my value is going to be for me one way, and my purpose is going to pull me the other way, and, and I'm, I'm going to be stuck in between. So, it's really important that we have connection between. Our values and our purpose, so we can go forward in, 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 a, in, a, in a forward direction. Uh, we absolutely need to be connected to community. A lot of research around loneliness uh, the lonelier we are, the less connected that we are. Um, there's a lot of, lot of research around uh, increasing anxiety and depression and, and suicide. But the one that I wanted to focus on a little bit here, and this is a little bit of your anatomy, a little bit of a technical aspect of it, is the thing that we refer to as the synapse. Now, the synapse. To get a little bit technical and, and, and anatomical with you, the synapse is the gap between two nerve cells. So this is a nerve cell, very crudely, I'm not, I'm not an artist, um, but very crudely drawn. The, the brain signal or the message down the spine or down the nerve comes through here, and then it has to jump across that gap to be able to get to the next nerve, and it goes down there. And that's what we refer to as the synapse. And that synapse in that gap is where we have all the different neurotransmitters, so dopamine and oxytocin, uh, and noradrenaline and adrenaline and serotonin. Uh, so the whole bunch of neurotransmitters that will take place in that area. But I bring this up because the stronger we make this connection, the greater we have the chance of what we refer to as neuroplasticity. So there's a concept in neuroscience that we refer to as the neurons that fire together wired together. The neurons that fire together, wire together. And basically what that means is that whatever habit we have, whether that's a good habit or a bad habit, so if we have a good habit, then it's going to strengthen that, con that connection. If we have a bad con uh, habit, it's still going to con strengthen that connection through repetition. So with repetition, we can change the brain that we have. So the message that I want to put forward by addressing this over here is that the brain that we have now is not the brain that we're destined to have, or the brain that we are born with is not the brain that we are destined to have to carry on into our, into our adult life, or into our later years, or into our, into our um, uh, uh, elder years. And it comes through with this concept of neuroplasticity. The brain is malleable, the brain is changeable. We can change it depending on the habits that we have. And it's through this thing over here, that was the synapse. So one of the key uh, uh, elements in connection is we want to strengthen that synaptic connection. And we do that through repetition and, 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 and being able to, uh, to change the brain or what we refer to as neuroplasticity. Very basic, very simple, very quickly moving on. The next one is calmness. And the calmness here really is around the stress response. Um, when we are stressed, then, then the stress takes place in an area of the brain that we refer to as the midbrain. And there are a couple of different reactions that the body will go through when, we, when we're in that midbrain function, when we're in that stressed function. And generally, the responses that we will have is that we tend to be reactive. You know, we will be, we'll be, we'll, we'll, we react to the tiger coming towards us. We're either going to have to either going to fight the tiger, or we're going to get down and we're going to mm -hmm. feed the tiger. Or one of them, we tend to also 
free. So we either fight free, free or, or free. So like the typical, typical and proverbial uh, rabbit in the headlights. But we tend to be more reactive. We are very definitely more in survival. And when we are stressed, we are very much in a degenerative state. So in other words, what I mean by degeneration, de de degenerative is that the body will break down a lot easier. The body will, uh, will, will not have the ability to be able to build and repair. And what we also tend to do is we tend to be disconnected. We tend to be disconnected from ourselves. We tend to be disconnected from, uh, from others. And I know that in this COVID situation that I was very definitely disconnected from my wakes. I was very definitely disconnected from my, from my morning ritual. I was very definitely disconnected from my core design feelings. As I've got into it, though, I've, gone, I've, I've, I've reconnected again because I was stressed. And when I was stressed, I was reacting. I was reacting to the environment that I was in. But I was very definitely in survival. So what am I, what am I going to do to be able to survive this? My practice was suffering. There was a whole bunch of different things. As I said just now, my, my core, one of my core values is exercise. I couldn't exercise. I was in survival. I absolutely degenerated and I absolutely disconnected. When we are less stressed though, then we go into a completely different area of the brain. We go into the upper cortical area of the brain and most specifically into a part of the brain that refers to the prefrontal cortex which is where a lot of executive function takes place, where we find meaning and be able to make decisions better. Um, and, and so the response that we have when we are less stressed is that we tend to be more creative. We tend to thrive, we tend to want to do things. We very definitely repair and very definitely connect and we have the best chance of being in a state of love. So to be stressed is not good. This shadows, this robs you of your experience. This robs you of your experience. This over here deepens your experience. And to be able to deepen your experience, we absolutely need to be able to calm ourselves down. And there are a number of different ways. Donna has some amazing uh, meditations that she, that she puts out. Um, and again, kudos to you, Donna. But, but essentially, to meditate, to pray, to have some kind of spiritual practice, whatever it is that you, whatever your faith is. To breathe, absolutely the quickest and most effective way. So we want to really breathe. There's lots of stuff online to breathe. We want to connect with nature. And then we also want to have just a chance to be able to nap and to regenerate and just to calm ourselves down. Robbing your experience deepens your experience. Really important to calm. Really, really important to calm. Next time we're going to get into is movement. Now, as a chiropractor, this is really where I a lot of my passion comes in is in movement as a chiropractor our major focus on alignment and movement specifically on the spine uh, and we do that because the spine is intimately connected to your brain and to your nervous system so from a chiropractic point of view it just absolutely fits into what it is that i'm saying here in 1981 there was a guy called roger sperry um, he was a neurobiologist and a neurophysiologist and won the Nobel prize in 1981 together with two other authors for work on split brain theory and, and Please don't ask me to go into that because I can't, I don't really know what split brain theory is, but he, he, got the, he got the Nobel Prize for that. And, and one of his things was that 90% of the stimulation and nutrition of the spine comes from movement. Movement, so stimulating your brain and nutrition to the brain is not only in the lack of sugar or the other things, fats that we need to eat, but it's movement. This is how we stimulate our brain, is through movement. And specifically, uh, the other benefits of movement is that it increases the blood flow to the brain, increased blood flow into the brain, blood carries oxygen, and the blood is enhanced into the brain, and you have more oxygen into the brain, the, better, the more oxygen you have, the better the brain's going to start to function. The more we exercise, and also the greater the production of what we refer to as brain derived neurotropic factor, or BDNF. And BDNF is very simplistic, it's is like it's like nerve fertilizer. So just now we went back to, the, to that connection thing is that we want to enhance that, those connections in, in, in the synapse. Um, and, and by moving, we enhance them. We give the, the nerve system and the nerves more fertilizers so that can grow, we can, we can, we can, um, we can uh, cement and enhance those, those connections. Without question, uh, exercise decreases stress. And so again, going back to that, uh, to that last uh, page where we, where we deepened or, or enhanced and, then, and deepened or, or, or robbed ourselves of our experience, we, we don't want to be stressed. And exercise managed to do that. 
And the other one it, it was movement it comes again specifically for me as a chiropractor is run posture. So when we have a posture that is tends to be very far forward uh, and a rounded shoulder, then then we have a, a decreased input into the brain. But when we are more upright uh, and moving properly, then we have a better input into the brain. Um, the brain is kind of like a computer and, and, and has the most efficient and brilliant operating system ever. But as an operating system, it's deeply dependent on the input. So like an operating system, if you're typing in something, you're on Google Maps, and you type in, well, I want to find Claremont, and you just type in Claremont, thinking that you're going to find Claremont in Cape Town, but you just type in Claremont, you can be taken to Claremont in Johannesburg, you can be taken to Claremont in, in Chicago. Specific. So it's depending on the input into the brain, that will depend what the output is. So it's not the operating system's problem, it's the input. So these are the things, those things, those seven things that, are, that we refer to um, will help them to input the brain. So posture is a huge one. And, and specifically, to get into some of the practical steps that we can do to enhance this, you know, this time we, we all on our computers, we, we consume a lot of online stuff. And because we consume a lot of online stuff, we're either doing it on our computers or we're doing it on our phone. But when we do that, we're basically not moving. So the practical step that I wanted to share with you today is really around how to sit. So if you excuse me for a second, I'm just going to shift the computer here or the, 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 uh, the, the camera. I'm going to shift into a different position so I can show you how to, how to set up your workstation. And we do that while we're at our, work, at our workstation, which I think will be massively beneficial. So give me, give me a couple of minutes there, or 30 seconds. I hope that doesn't fall over. Give me a quick tour of my office here. All right. Everyone could see that because I can't really see myself on that screen there, but uh, this is me at my, at my desk. So this is a critical, uh, critical uh, uh, practical tool for you to be able to do. So a lot of us are working from home. We're not at our, our usual work desk at, at work. So we're either working off, off the, the dining room table, we're working off the couch, we're on our bed, you know, we're on the kitchen counter, wherever it is, but we're not in our normal setup. And some of us even at work don't have the setup correctly. So I, I really wanted to go over this, and, and, and I think this is, this is of, of, of huge value, and I, and I hope you find it of, of huge value. So to set up your desk doesn't start with a desk. It starts with you and your sitting position. And the scarring place for this is that we want, and you can't see my feet here, I know that, but where you want to have is that you want to have your feet flat on the ground. Flat on the ground, and then when you're in your seat, I kind of like these kind of chairs because they go up and down, and, and to be honest, I would prefer a ball or a ball chair. But essentially what you want to do is you want to adjust the seat pan so that the angle between your thighs and your body is at about 90 degrees or slightly greater than 90 degrees. So I'm going to mention a couple of different angles and if you can't remember them, then just remember that all the angles are 90 or slightly greater than 90. It's very simple to remember. But basically what you want to do is that you want to be sitting with your seat pan at about 90 or slightly greater than 90. The backrest also at 90 or slightly greater than 90. And then everything else sets up from here. So from here, I like to have a chair that doesn't have the armrest because if you have the armrest, you can't get under your desk. So try and have a chair that doesn't have armrest so that you can actually weave yourself under the desk into that position over here. Now, the next angle that you want to remember is that when your, your hands are on the top of your desk, you want this angle between the forearm and your arm, again, to be 90 or slightly greater than 90. Again, 90 or slightly greater than 90. And so that's the position that you want to be in. From here, you want to set up your computer. And for this position, you want your computer in your computer screen to be roughly an arm's length away from you. And critical is that you want the top of the monitor to be at about eye level. And then that's the setup of your screen or, the, the, or, or, or your laptop. If you have a laptop, I strongly advise you, I mean, these are two pieces or three pieces of plank that I threw together and I jammed them together with a couple of screws. 
when I worked out the height that I needed. Uh, uh, but you don't have to make this. You can have a couple of books. I mean, who uses a telephone book anymore? So you know, stack your telephone books up, or or, or, or the, the shelf help books. You know, all those things that you're not using. So stack it up so that your monitor is here. And then I strongly advise, if you are working on a laptop, to not be in that position, but to invest, really this is not a cost, but invest in a wireless keyboard and a wireless mouse. Because ideally what you want is that you want the keyboard to be here. You want it to be in this position over here. You don't want it to be far forward because then you're going to be getting forward. And then you're going to be tired and then you're going to start to do this. And that's a position that I discuss this with patients, that's a position that people find themselves in all the time. So in this position, and then they give me more time from there, and they go, oh, no, I can't be. I'm going to be in this position over here. And then you stay in that position for hours. And now you're not in that position, guess what's not happening? Is your brain's not receiving the information. It's not receiving the input. What just Barry said, movement is the nutrition and the stimulation for the brain. So you stay in this position for long periods of time. Now you feel like you're distracted, and your productivity goes down, and you're like, oh, hang on, let me just go and check a YouTube clip. And then you, get, and then you go down the world. Warrant and the rabbit warrant of, 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 of distraction and, and decreased productivity. So, this is the position that you want to be in. The other thing that you want to do is that you want to make sure that your screen is right in front of you. Don't have it to the left or don't have it to the right because if you have it to the left or to the right, you're going to start to create uh, muscle imbalances into the neck and you're going to start with headaches and shoulder pain, lower back pain. A lot of um, my patients and clients out there sometimes work off two, maybe even three screens. And so my advice here, again, is that if you're working with two screens, which is the one that you work off most? And have that one in front of you. It's a common thing that patients will come in and they say, well, they've got two screens, which one are you working with most? The left one. Well, don't put the left one there, put the left one in front of you. Or if you're working with both of them equally, have them balanced in front of you. But most important, that you don't want to be, you don't want to get into a position that we asymmetrical or unbalanced. You want to be as balanced as what you can. So what are some of the things that we can do uh, that when you're at the, at the, at the workstation and, and here? It's number one, we want to move as much as what we can. And there are a couple of different things that we want to do. Number one, what I strongly suggest is to have water with you. When you've got water with you, when you're drinking, and I try to drink every, every half an hour, 20 minutes, drink water because when you drink water, the more water you drink, the more you're hydrating your body, but the more you're hydrating your body, then there's this very desire for you to get up and go have a wee. So what that does is that it encourages you to get up and move. So that's the other thing, is have water, hydrate yourself. When you're hydrating yourself, it's going to encourage you to get up and move. Because every 20, every 25 to 30 minutes, you've got to get up and move. You've got to stretch, you've got to, you've got to stretch those muscles out, but you want to get nutrition and stimulation into the brain. So movement is really important, and you can set up a little timer on your watch, or on the phone, or even on the computer, just to ping. And that ping can set up to say, okay, well, I need, I need to move. The other thing that you want to do is, is that when you're at the desk, because we're typing a lot, is that you want to have small, intricate movements, small, complicated movements. The brain craves complexity. And the brain craves complexity, but it also craves movement. So just simple, what we call figure of eights with your wrists, and your hands and your fingers. And then just flick your hands like this. And at the same time, just turn. You can't see, you can't see my feet or my, my, my ankles, but just rotating the ankles round and round. Uh, I, I don't want to get too complicated here, but the, the, in the brain, the, the, the large part of your sensory and motor part of the brain is, is, is designated and designed to your fingers, your toes, and your hands. So when we move, we're stimulating a greater and larger part of your brain. So the gross and the major movement part of your body is stimulating a smaller part of your brain, but this, your fingers and your toes, stimulates a greater part of your brain. So even while you're sitting, figure of eights, flick, wiggle your toes, move your toes around. And then get up and move. Get up and move and hydrate. Same applies with your phone. So the phone, uh, you, you know, when we text or we, we SMS or, or Whatever we're doing is we don't we don't have our phones and have them over here. We tend to have our phones in this position. And again, when we're in that position, there's this decreased input into the brain. So how we engage with our phone and how we engage with our devices over here, it's not to say that you need to get rid of this stuff. I mean that, that's that's ridiculous and it's, it's just not gonna happen. But but the relationship that we have with these 
And the environment that we create around here is very definitely important as to how your brain moves and functions. So I, I'm not sure, I think I'm, I'm, I'm nearly over my time here. I hope that was helpful uh, and I hope this was beneficial for you. And, and, and essentially what I want to do is really just to recap. Recap as so far as that you're, you know, your, your brain is involved in absolutely, absolutely everything you do. It's involved in movements, it's involved in the senses. The, the more we, we, we can make sense of our world, the more we are able to integrate the world, the, the more we are able to make the appropriate response to our environment. It's involved in decision making and meaning and, and connection and decisions. Um, it's involved in connection uh, as well, as I said already. Remember that there are those five, seven things that we need, the brain absolutely needs. Um, and then just remember how it is that we, what we need to do. Uh, we need to set this thing up and we need, to, we need to be really cognizant of this, especially in this time where we spend a lot of our time consuming online stuff and consuming things that we have. So I hope that was helpful. Um, I love to have your feedback. It's, it's, this is a passion. Uh, this is something that I absolutely love to do. I love to teach. So, um, if there are any questions, I, I'm not watching the chat. Donna said that she will check it out. If there are any questions that are there, fire away. I, I want to be respectful of the time, though, so I know that we, we slightly over kind of 34 minutes. So, if you need to go, please go. But if there's anybody that needs me to answer anything, it would be great. Awesome. So, everyone is saying thank you. Thank you so much. It was a great help, says Tabitha. Very helpful, says SD. Thank you, says Tabitha. Um, Dumi says, thank you so much. Linda says, really good, thank you. Um, Inga says, yes, I had huge issues with posture and had someone help me with my desk, laptop, chair. So everything you're saying is super valuable and important in the world right now. And Chloe says, thanks, we're gonna raise my laptop. Um, Bronwyn says, yep, absolutely great, really helpful. Um, Tanya has a question. Her question is, if the angles of which you spoke are less than 90 degrees, does that impact on the flow in the body? So the research is really around 90 and, 90, uh, 90 and slightly greater than 90. The angles there, so, so the first thing that, that we need to make uh, a, a massive point on is, is that sitting is, on not, is not our natural position. We're not designed to sit, we're absolutely designed to move. But the, those angles is, is that when you're in a, so, so let me go back a step, is that when you're sitting and you're in a correct, ergonomically correct position, the one that I've designed or will show to you, and you've got a good back, it still increases the gravitational stress in your back by about 30%. Now, if you change those angles and you change the, the condition of your back or your spine, and then exponentially increases the impact that it will have. So the research is around those angles. I, 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 would, I would say, yes, it will affect the flow. Um, to the degree to which it will be affected, I don't know. But, but so I've given you uh, the setup for a, for a sitting station. I way prefer a, a standing desk because when you're in a standing desk, you're constantly moving. Uh, and I prefer to have a ball chair because when you're in a ball chair, you're unstable. So what you have to do is you have to do this. So your spine's moving, and as your spine's moving, it's getting a stimulation to the brain. So sitting in a sedentary position like this is not ideal. I've, I, I recently wanted to buy one of these, and I. Lockdown, I just haven't been able to get one. I don't do a lot of sitting on most of the time with my patients, so I'm, I'm doing a lot of standing. But I need to answer your question is, is that it's not to sit is not great, but you want to minimize the risk and the, and the research to minimize that risk is really around those angles. I hope that, I hope that answers your question. Yep, she's nodding her head vigorously. Um, right. Inga says, Some of the movements you spoke about I teach in my movement near classes, so it completely makes sense why we now do finger flicks. So she knows so, not. Yeah, I just, sorry, I have to interrupt you. I, I, I thought about you so much when I was talking about that movement section, and I, and I hope that you have done so great. Awesome. Um, Amanda says, thank you. That was very interesting. Karen says, thanks for your presentation. Really enjoyed the information around movement. Very interesting and useful. Um, Simone also says, well, um, well really interesting. Um, Liesl Fildeun, who's on our other group, who's on our Wednesday group, Will says, I would love to connect with you. Maybe do an interview with you on my private group. Ah, Fantastic. See, look at that. The universe is sending you answers already. So um, I'll connect the two of you. Michelle says, thank you. thank you for your presentation. Loved it. Very interesting and so practical. Uh, Hannah says, regarding the standing, when people stand a lot, they tend to develop varicose veins. Um, did you have something else you wanted to say, Hannah, about that? Yeah, she's going to pop on. 
I was just wondering, how do you prevent it then? Because I, I know they say you should stand, but then I know for people that stand all day, they get problems with their legs because you're also not supposed to stand all day because you've got all the gravity and all the fluids going into your legs. Yeah. Sorry, I missed the last session there, Hannah. How, how do you prevent, how can you find the right balance to prevent that from forming, you know, a leg problem? It's from stuck yeah. Good, good question, valid question, and I can't give you an answer, an honest answer. I, I think, you know, I, I would rather. I think that's very definitely a vascular issue, um, and and I, I don't want to give you an answer that is incorrect. But I'm just going to thumb suck on. So I can't give you an honest answer on that. I will try and do some research for you, then I can get back to you either uh, on on Facebook, or we can press, you know, we can private messages at it. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Great question. Yeah, it's just that people are so so busy promoting those those standing desks, and I know people that stand all day and they develop the, all those other problems. Yeah, yeah. Can I uh, chime in because I use a standing desk and I love it. And the the idea of a standing desk is to be able to stand for like forty five minutes, half an hour, and then sit again. So you've got Correct. both, Correct. and it works really then you get that balance and it makes you tired when you're standing and then you want to sit and then you get stiff and then you want to stand and it's really it helps a lot yeah 100 percent and that's and that's so to go stand so you're not you're not you're not because we've been sitting for most of our lives or as adult lives especially if, we, if, we, if we've got a desk our job is that we're not physically fit to be in a standing position so you're 100 you've got to transition slowly into that so to, to go and spend the whole day in a standing is, is unpractical and, and you're definitely fatigued. So, so the, the guidelines are very, very definitely around transitioning slowly, slowly, slowly. It's, you know, it's like an exercise program. You can't, dump in, you can't jump into the deep end. You've got to kind of walk into the shallow end and learn and, and then slowly get a transition into the, into the deep end. So yeah, great, great point. Um, well, so Tabitha, sorry for the shouting back. <laughs> Hey, Mr. Luke. Um, Tabitha says, I think it's more important now is working from home. Okay, hold on. I'm going to have to give him away. Hold on. Uh, Tabitha says, I think it's more important now with working from home, maybe consider providing these chats and consultations to organizations who've embarked on a working from home for their employees as part of virtual employee wellness. So just an idea for you. Uh, Tanya says, this Thank has you. been a most engaging presentation. Thanks, Will. Um, please give us your contact info. Um, please, yeah, maybe write it on the board so people know how to contact you. Um, Esty says, Donna, would you connect me and Will as well? Please, I'd love to interview him for an article. Ha, huh, look at that, Will. Hey, Inga says, um, yeah, about the standing desk, she shared with that, and that's it. Yeah, so awesome. thank, thank you so, so, so much, Will. Um, I'm not sure if there are any more questions. If there are, please pop on and let us know. Um, we've had 19 people here today, so just to let you know, Will, you so 19 people, um, and I will also pop this recording with the live session recordings that I haven't popped up yet onto the Facebook groups, both Facebook groups, so people can watch it. And I will give you the recording, Will, so you can do whatever you want with it and use it and upload it Thank to you YouTube know. and do what you want with it. Um, yeah. And yeah, congratulations and well done for getting accountable and just doing, doing it. I'm so chuffed for you and that you just did it. We managed to get through your procrastination monster and we didn't have to like go into the analysis paralysis of why, you know, you just did it. And it was so helpful. It was so valuable. It was great. Your, for me, your personality really came through. It was, it felt very relaxed. I don't know if you were relaxed, but it felt very relaxed. You felt very in your flow and yeah, I'm delighted for you that you've kind of just taken the first step. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, again, a uh, heart, heart, heartfelt thank you to you and to what you're doing for us in the group, for me, for giving me this opportunity. And thanks for 19 people. That's that's just amazing. I've had three people who have been great. So I'm just hugely grateful for the guys, guys and girls. And I think guys are mostly girls, I think. But I'm uh, hugely grateful that you've given up your time and, uh, and, and I'm going to move for your presence. It's just it's amazing. Thank you so much. And thank Yay! You for the we can't wait until you're speaking to 5,000 people and we'll be like, we were one of the first 19 that ever heard him speak. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, everyone. Goodbye. I'll see you on Facebook. Bye.